Today's modern bass boats, you find a lot of cool electronical components on it, like the new Ultrax trolling motor, 360 imaging, big powerful units like the Humminbird Solix and the Humminbird Helix units that are in big screens up to 12 to 15 inches. Plus your boat comes with lots of other equipment like aerators, uh, Oxymax live well systems, and all kinds of electronic components. Shallow water anchors, like the Minkota Talons, they all take electricity. That big Yamaha 250 show takes electricity too. It takes electricity to get started, and the rest of it takes electricity to run. The most critical investment you can make in your boat is right here in the back. Yeah, that Minkota charger is going to do a lot, but it's what it's going to charge, and it's your batteries. Your trolling motor batteries and your starting battery. And today, we're going to discuss, it's not the size of the box, it's what's inside the box that really matters. And there's two different types of batteries that you should look for in your boat. You're going to need batteries for your trolling motor system. That's going to be a deep cycle battery. You're going to need a battery to run your electronics and start your motor. And that is what we call a starting battery. There's different types of batteries out there. There's the traditional lead acid, which is basically a flooded cell, um, is what, like what we've got here. There's an AGM battery, which is an absorbed glass mat. Basically, the glass mat absorbs the acid and holds it in there versus a liquid uh, battery acid in the battery here. The other type is lithium batteries. They're coming new to the market. Um, one of the advantages of them is lightweight. My preference is still the good old-fashioned lead-acid battery because I have found that the length of reserve capacity and maintaining those electronics and the ease of charging them with my Minn Kota Precision Charger, I have seen longer run times. I've tried the AGM batteries. They're great batteries, but for me and running all the electronics that I run and everything that I've done, I found better performance out of a flooded wet cell battery. But what we want to talk about is there's different there's different specs that you need to look at. You buy the most awesome boat with the most awesome motor with all the most awesome accessories. But did you talk to your dealer about the battery? Yes, the battery is probably one of the most critical components when purchasing a boat or even upgrading your current boat with with a new electrical system. When you're purchasing a deep cycle battery you need to look at one thing reserve capacity. Reserve capacity is going to tell you how long you can run how much available power is available to run your trolling motor. That is for your deep cycle battery that's doing 100 percent is doing your trolling motor longevity. Think of, a, think of a battery as a bank account. If you don't put money in it, there isn't money to take out. And if you keep taking money out, sometimes it's going to run out. That's the same thing. This trolling motor, it's taking money out of your bank account. So if you don't have a big enough bank account to run your trolling motor, you're going to run out at the end of the day. Or when it gets windy, you're going to start taking out more money than uh, on a nice calm day when it's going to take out a little bit at a time. That's an easy analogy of understanding electricity and what it needs to run trolling motors. Now the other thing is is you've got different trolling motors. You have 12 volt, we have we had 12 24 volts, 24 volt trolling motors and 36 volt trolling motors. If you look at the specs at the amp draws of the trolling motor, the 36 volt trolling motor is going to take the least amount of amps it's running three batteries to create 36 volts. It's going to take the least amount of amps per hour out of that trolling motor. So you're going to get a longer run time when those windy conditions kick up or you're fishing longer and the fish are biting and you want to spend more time on the water, a 36 volt trolling motor is going to allow you to do that. One of my suggestions if you're looking for trolling motors, if you're looking within those amp ranges, look at the maximum thrust in that range because what it does you don't have to run as high a percentage to get the same speed out of the trolling motor. 
So you can draw less amps because you're not running it at 100% throttle or foot speed. You're running, you're backing it off and getting that same speed at lower RP, at lower pedal settings. So that's one of the things to look at when you're purchasing a trolling motor. But batteries, probably the most difficult one out there is the starting battery. And I hear people say, well, I bought the biggest group code that I could buy. That group code don't mean squat. We're going to get that again. I, I'm going to repeat it. Group code doesn't mean nothing except the physical size of the battery. It doesn't tell you what's inside. And what's inside the battery is what really matters. What's inside the box? That's what really matters when you look at batteries. Here we have a cutaway example of a traditional 12 volt battery. You have your positive terminal and you have your negative terminal. And then you've got your fills that you normally can see from there. But we can take the top off of this battery and show you what's inside. When you look inside, you actually see six chambers. One, two, three, four, five, six. This one, we're just showing examples. Um, you have a positive feed and a negative feed that's coming up to the place. This is your terminal that's going up to the negative terminal. Your positive terminal would come off of this side. But those pieces right there are connected to individual plates. If you look inside of here, you see we have a, met, uh, a plate here. That one is actually attached. It's attached to this positive lug. So you have a positive plate, and then the negative plate is jacketed, then you have a positive plate here, and so on, to build up your, basically your voltage in each battery. How it's built inside of here is what's going to matter when you purchase your battery. It's the amount of capacity that these plates are able to, the electricity they're able to store. One thing, if this plate, if a positive plate sulfates and a piece of it falls off and touches a negative plate, it will short that circuit out. Uh, that is why they're jacketed uh, to prevent uh, cross or shorting out of the, of the plates. That's basically the inside. When you look, you will see that this side is positive, this side is negative. Positive versus negative increases our voltage as we go along, and that's how a 12 volt battery is built inside the battery. For example, and if you look at this picture here, this is a group 24 battery here. XI batteries makes three different group 24 batteries. And you can see on this slide right here that the crank, marine cranking amps, cold cranking amps, and your reserve capacity are your three factors. In the boating industry, marine cranking amps is what the outboard manufacturers are going to recommend for their starting of their outboard. Today's electronic fuel injected motors, most every manufacturer recommend the minimum of 1,000 marine cranking amps. Yes, 1,000 marine cranking amps to do it. For example, this battery here is only 650. So it's not going to be enough to fire that big Yamaha spin the starter fast enough to get it started. So you, this would be an under efficient battery and would not allow that motor to start. So if you look at marine cranking amps as the first thing to start your motor. The most important thing for your hummingbird fish finders, your talons, your research pumps, your bilge pumps, all your onboard boat electronics that you have is reserve capacity. You need a good combination. You need that thousand marine cranking amps and then you need to look for the most reserve capacity that you can buy. Don't buy on price, buy on specs and you will have trouble free performance out of your outboard and your boat or your boat system. Batteries here as we show have different marine have different reserve capacities and it, and these are all ranked at 25 amps. Some manufacturers actually uh, play with different amp ratings. 25 is kind of the industry standard. That's minutes of reserve capacity at 100%, 25 amps, which is quite a bit. You think about your Humminbird Helix, 
the fuse is protected by a 3 amp fuse, so it's not drawing over 3 amps. So, you start adding all this amperage and stuff together that you're using. Talons, bilge pumps, recirc pumps, uh, live well fill pumps, starting a boat. You pull that reserve capacity down and you don't have enough, you're dead on the water. So, first thing, starting battery, marine cranking amps. Second thing is reserve capacity. Reserve capacity is the most important spec when purchasing a battery. Then the third most important step is is choosing the right charger. I run the Minn Kota Precision Charger here because it offers a three-phase charging. It has bulk, which is going to try to get that battery up to full capacity, and then it's going to go into an absorption mode that is going to do the final top-off of that battery, and then it's going to go into a maintenance mode. Maintenance mode is basically as the battery discharges a little bit, it'll charge it back up. In my boat, I have a starting battery and three trolling motor batteries. They're all hooked to my one Minn Kota charger. I just plug it in when I'm done fishing and it takes care of all my battery needs. Having the correct charger is going to make your life and your boating fun a lot more easier because you're charging the batteries in the correct way. The Minn Kota Precision Charger will charge gel, flooded, or AGM batteries. There's different charge cycles based on the type of battery and Minn Kota has matched that with their charger. It is also temperature compensated so on a hot day it's not going to over gas that battery and boil the battery and charge it in an inappropriate manner. That is why you should not use an automotive charger to charge a deep cycle or I would even recommend any marine battery. You've chosen the right battery now the next most critical phase of fishing electronics and trolling motors is having the right wiring. And one of the analogies I use for wiring is you can get wire in all different sizes. You can get there's a small one, here's another size, there's a bigger size. This is what trolling motors use. This is what I use for powering graphs and stuff. But this is like your garden hose. This is like the fire hose that the fire department uses. We can get the same voltage or pressure. Pre voltage is like pressure. You can get the same pressure out of a garden hose as you do a fire hose. But can you get the same volume? Could that little wire carry the same volume as this big wire? No, it can't. So that is why firemen use big round hoses to fight house fires and, and fires, not garden hoses. The same reason why your boat and your fishing electronics, the more electronics you put on the boat, the more power that you need to give those electronics. That's why if you start that big motor, and the unit powers down or you get a low voltage alarm it's probably because of undersized wiring from the battery to the unit as recommended by the, the electronics manufacturer Humminbird you should always wire your battery direct from the battery to the unit you should fuse it at the battery to protect the, the wiring in the fuse system it's one of the reasons I use what we call a 10 gauge 2 AWG wire. This is two this is two 10 gauge wires a positive a red and a black and if you look in here you can see the red and black it's all run together you can pull it in as a single wire up to your console where your your units are and use that to power your units that's going to allow them enough current to properly operate as Humminbird and Minn Kota and design those units to operate. Your, your unit is only as good as your power supply. If you don't have the right batteries, you don't have the right wiring, your unit can't perform as it was designed. It's not a Humminbird problem, it's not a Minn Kota problem, it's a rigging problem. And 99% of most rigging, pro of most 
problems or because of installation or rigging. So hardware failures are very low. They can, you can think it's a hardware failure, but it's probably more likely a wiring failure. Today I'm going to set up a little display here at the workbench. We've got a light. This light's going to draw a pretty heavy load. We can take it over here. We'll just slide this over. And you can see how bright that light is. That light is, pr is pretty dang bright. That's a pretty decent size gauge wiring that's, that's powering that. One of the tools that I have access to from work is what we call a infrared camera. And an infrared camera allows me to look at components. And we'll just pull back here. You can see my light bulb. And we'll move that crosshair up there. We're 96 degrees in climbing. It's 100 degrees there now. And if you look at that wiring, you can see the temperature is starting to rise on it. You can see it right here. As it creates resistance, it actually creates higher temperatures. And what we're going to show you is I'm going to take that wire off. We're looking at about 80, some to 80 to 85 degrees of the temperature on that wire. What we're going to do is we're going to disconnect that wire. And that wire was a larger gauge wire. And we're going to go to this little smaller gauge wire. And what we're going to do is we're going to act like we got a butt connector or too small a wire. We're just going to crimp a couple of them wires right there underneath my battery terminal. But we want to look at that wire and the temperature of it. It's going to take a little bit as it builds resistance. Man, we're already up in the 90 degrees on that wire. Look at how much hotter that is. We're pushing 90 degrees. Look at that right there. We're, in, we're pushing 90. It's creating resistance and creating heat because of that wire. The connector's even gotten hotter. Our light bulb's getting hotter because it's taking more resistance. We're up in the 120s right now. But look at that. We get our temperature line on there. If you can see that, it's 97, 98 degrees on that wire with that infrared camera. That is showing you what happens. That's a perfect example of what happens in your boat. If these units are trying to pull power, they create resistance, they create a lot of heat, they're trying to get everything they need to, to, run, op, to, to run the way they're designed, but they run out of juice. It's kind of like you. It's a hot day out there, and you're not drinking water and your electrolytes and that stuff. You kind of run out of juice at the end of the day. Same thing happens with your units. If you don't give them the right amount of juice, they can't do what they're designed to do. So make sure you have the right battery, the right wiring, to allow your hummingbirds and your minkotas the proper operation, and you'll get you enjoy the time on the water. Understanding your boat's power supply will help you get more out of your investment in Hummingbird and Mincota products. And make sure you get the right battery to match the needs of your boat, your trolling motors requirements, your graph requirements, and all your boating accessories that the manufacturers have built on your boat. And then make sure that you've got the right power supply to those products to allow them to have the right amount of current to operate as designed. Hummingbird and Minn Kota engineers go to great extent to make sure these products work and all these new features they add to it. Make sure you allow them the opportunity to do what they're designed to do to help you get more out of your investment and enjoy more time on the water. Thank you for tuning in to another set of tips and tricks and I hope that helps you learn a little bit more about how critical your boat electrical system is and to the reliability and the quality of performance that you get from the products you purchase. Thank you and tune in next time.